name I pray, amen and amen. All right, guys, are you ready for the word today? Yes. Five people, fantastic. All right, let me preach to those five, amen. Well, there's only about seven people here. Yeah, right. so. <laughs> uh, yes. Hey, guys, if, if we yes, would... Uh, exactly. If we would title our talk today, it would be called What to Put On to Get God's Attention. Yeah. What to Put On to Get God's here, Attention. But, you know. Uh, as you know, we are in the middle of a church-wide fast. Guys, this is week number two. Amen. Let me quickly share a, a, a couple of awesome testimonies. We, we've talked to some people. We've heard about some blessings. Come on, we heard about some breakthroughs. On, and we heard about some bondages being broken so far. We're, we're but here's a cool third, thing. We're on our third week. We ain't done yet. Amen. That's right. That's right. This is starting week number three. Uh, and the finish line is in sight. Can you see? Amen. You know, uh, the cool thing is fasting is all through the Bible. You heard us say last week, and, and when Jesus talked in Matthew chapter 6, speaking on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, when you fast, come on guys, not if you fast, but he said when you fast. In other words, it was a commandment. It was not something that we have a choice in the matter if we want to obey the word or not. It was commanded by the Lord to do so. Can you say amen? Amen. The first week we talked about um, what to take out, what to put in, right? Um, putting in more of Jesus. The second week, last week, we talked about um, how our do affects our breakthrough, that the physical act of obedience here brings spiritual release in heaven. Mm -hmm. And then this week we're going to uh, talk about not only um, what we do, because we're going to continue to do, and, and not only what we put in, but what we put on that gets God's attention. So there's two stories that we want to call your attention to in the Word of God. Um, two females that went before men. Um, when they went before these men, they had to be prepared. And when they were prepared, um, they got their attention and it made all the difference. Pastor's going to tell the stories of Ruth and Esther, some of my favorite stories in the Bible. How many know these two women were bad to the bone? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Amen. Yeah. Uh, like I said a second ago, these two women were bad to the bone, and I, I want to quickly, if I could, uh, share their story, basically in a nutshell, if I could this morning. Um, but in order for us to talk about Ruth, what we need to do, first of all, is we got to go back. we got to give you the backstory of her mother-in-law, which lays the foundation for Ruth's story. So the Bible says in Ruth chapter 1 uh, that Naomi, which was her future mother-in-law and her father-in-law and, and uh, Naomi's two sons left Bethlehem because they were starving. And it wasn't because of the fast. Come on, guys. It was because there was a famine that was taking place in the land of Bethlehem. So the Bible says they left Bethlehem and, and traveled to a far and foreign land, hoping that things would be better when they got there. So the Bible says that once they got there, things went from bad to worse. Because Naomi's husband died in this foreign land, leaving her and her two sons to fend for themselves. But as time went on, the Bible says both of the boys fell in love and they got married. Things were good for a short time. But how many of you know the old saying goes that all good things must come to an end, right? So the Bible says that both of the boys, for some reason, died, leaving their mother to live in this foreign land with both of their daughters-in-law. Now, here's what happened. Several years later, we find out that uh, word got back to Naomi all the way in the, in the land of Moab, this pagan land, if you will, that, that Bethlehem now began to flourish, and the favor of God was placed one more time on them. They were no longer starving, but now they were living in the blessings of God. So they begin to make their way back to Bethlehem, and this is what happened. Naomi looked at both of her daughters-in-law and said, Look, guys, you don't have to go with me. There's no longer any obligation whatsoever. My sons are gone. You have no obligation to me as your mother-in-law. You don't have to go with me. So the, both of the girls looked and said, No, we're going to go with you. And Naomi said, Look, let me, let, me, let me put it to you this way. She goes, I'm an old woman. I'm not married. But what happened if I got married today? And miraculously, I had a baby today. Would both of you wait until this young man, or this young baby rather, was grown all the way to be married? Would you wait for him? So the Bible says both of the women grabbed on to her. They held her. They wept. And Orpah, one of the daughters-in-law, 
turned around and walked off into the sunset never to be seen of or heard of again. But the other one by the name of Ruth looked at her, and I love these words. You hear these at weddings all the time. She looked at Ruth and said, don't make me leave you. She goes, where you go, I'll go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die there also. So the Bible says they went back to Bethlehem, and I love this story because when they went back to Bethlehem, everybody was excited to see this woman by the name of Naomi. So when she approached the city of Bethlehem, they pointed fingers and said, Naomi, is it really you? See, 10 years had passed. And Naomi looked at him and said, my name is no longer Naomi. See, the word Naomi means pleasant. She goes, I am no longer pleasant. My, my, both my boys died. My, 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 my husband is buried in this foreign land. She goes, from now on, call me Mara, which means bitter. See, here's the thing. She left Bethlehem to get better, but she came back to Bethlehem bitter. Can you say amen? Now, guys, here's the point I want to make today quickly. Ruth the daughter-in-law that came back to Bethlehem with her. The Bible says that they showed up in Bethlehem during the barley harvest. Guys, can I tell you, this is no accident. This is divine appointment. This was not a coincidence that they showed up, that this was a, a, a sanctified setup from our Savior. Can I get a witness, somebody? Now, here's the cool part. The field that she began to work in was owned once, one more time, watch this, no, not a coincidence. The field they began to work in was actually owned by somebody that was related to her late husband. His name was Boaz. He was the best-looking bachelor in all of Bethlehem. Can I get a witness, somebody? Now, here's the cool part. Not only was he the best-looking, but the Bible says he was blessed beyond belief. And I'm going to share with you in just a few minutes the rest of of this story, the awesome things that happened in her life when she listened and obeyed the words of her mother-in-law. Now, guys, let's quickly uh, look at the story of Esther. Incredible story. As a matter of fact, Esther chapter 1 uh, tells us the story of Esther, a young Jewish orphan girl, and King Xerxes the first. By the way, the Bible says this man was one of the most powerful kings that ever ruled in the Bible. He had a vast territory that covered 127 provinces from India all the way to Ethiopia. His kingdom stretched that far. And the Bible says that in the third year of his reign, watch this, the king threw a party. Now, this was not your ordinary party. I would say this would be more of a perpetual party because the Bible says it lasted for six years months straight. A hundred and eighty days to be precise. Come on, that's a party. Can you say amen? Now here's a crazy thing. When the party ended, just for good measure, he threw a banquet that lasted for seven days. And he invited all the men, the high up officials, the rulers, the guards, and the, the captains and the generals of his army. And watch this. The Bible says that when they uh, had a little too much to drink. And how many know from your past when, and I, I do mean your past, can I get a witness, somebody? Uh, how many know that when a bunch of guys get together and you're drinking, doing things you shouldn't do, you begin to talk about things you shouldn't talk about, probably brag about things? Don't act no holy. I mean, come on, we've all been there, right? Well, the Bible says that what he wanted to do was bring his beautiful wife, the queen, to put on her royal crown and come and show off her beauty in front of these men. Now, here's the crazy part. Her assets. Absolutely. <laughs> Jewish commentaries say this, that the only thing the king wanted her to wear was her crown. So the Bible tells us the queen refused, right dug her feet in the ground, and said, I am not going to parade myself like a piece of meat in front of a bunch of men. Come on, guys. However, because of her standing her ground, the Bible says that she was made an example. And because of her not obeying the king, the Bible says there was a decree that was signed that she was to be banished from the kingdom of Persia, never to be seen of or heard of again. Why? Because the officials, watch this, the officials said, King, if you don't make an example of her 
Because she did not obey you, then our wives will not obey us. It will wreak havoc throughout the entire kingdom. You got to do something. So the Bible says she was banished. Because how many of you know that as time went on, the king got lonely? Amen. Because every man needs a better woman. Can I get a witness? So the Bible says that there began to be, now listen, this is in the Bible, a, a, a kingdom-wide beauty contest. From India all the way down to Ethiopia, one more time, in 127 provinces, they were looking for the most beautiful and most qualified women that could become queen. So the Bible says there was a young Jewish woman, one more time, an orphan raised by her older cousin Mordecai that was chosen to be one of the contestants. Not to get ahead of myself, but certain things happened. There was a purification process. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But I want you to understand, Esther had favor from God. She was beautiful. And because of her beauty, she was chosen to be queen. Now, some of you might say, well, that's not fair. You're right. That's favor. And I would have, rather have favor, God's favor, than anything else. Can you say amen? All right, guys, so watch this. Here's what happened. As time went on, we find out that there was an evil man that came into power by the name of Haman. Haman hated all of the Jewish people. And he decided to put in action a plan that would kill every single Jewish person. Now watch this. Her older cousin Mordecai overheard what was happening. He put on sackcloth and ashes, which in the Old Testament was symbolic of humbling yourself before God. Then he began to pray out that God would save their generation. And as word got back to Esther, the queen, she told Mordecai to gather in the entire Jews throughout the kingdom to all pray and begin to fast that God would make a difference. Now watch this. They begin to pray and begin to fast for three solid days. And can I testify today that heaven began to open up? Because the very man that was trying to kill Mordecai, even Queen Esther and all the Jewish people, the Bible says he was killed himself. Can I tell you today, because of their praying and because of their fasting, God protected his people, saved the Jews from genocide. Come on, guys. And they continued to flourish and to have favor. Why? Because they fasted and they believed God. So um, the reason why, Pastor, um, we chose these two stories, um, we're talking about fasting, and we're, we're heading into the last week, and We've been talking a lot about food. Um, we have, right? Like when you're talking to each other, you're talking a lot about food. You're trying to not talk about food. You're trying to talk about Jesus. You're trying to remember that it's about prayer and what you're putting in, that, that it's, it's not about the food, that it's really about um, what we're putting in its place. When we're going into this last week, how many have have received some breakthroughs already. Oh, yeah. I know that our family has yeah, in, a, in a big way. Yeah. I'm so excited about the testimony service on yeah. Sunday night. Um, as we're going into this last week, um, it's important that we continue to do everything that we're doing. It's, it's important that we continue to pray and that we continue to worship. It's, it's important that we continue to know that what we do on earth is moving heaven, yeah. regardless of what we're seeing or not seeing. Yeah. Um, and we want, to, we want to point out that Ruth and Esther, they were being prepared and they were going before their king. And one of the things that we're doing through this fast is we're, we're getting before our king. We're getting close to our beloved. And through this last week, we're on our home stretch, and we're going to tell you next weekend that fasting should be and should become a way of life yeah. as a Christian, yeah. Yeah. not just something that we do once a year, right. but right. it should be something that when we recognize 
that we've collected too much junk in our life that we clear it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that when we're too far away from the Lord, that we know how to get close to him. That when we need a breakthrough, we know what to do. Um, but right now, what we're doing in this last week is we want to draw closer to our God. We want to draw closer to our beloved. Mm -hmm. And so both in these situations with Ruth and Esther, they were called to great things. They were called to a great destiny. We're all called to do great things for God. That's right. Both of these women um, were called to do extraordinary things for God. They were, um, Ruth was, was called to change and to be a part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. Esther was, um, was called to, to save all of, of God's chosen people. But both of them were nobodies and nothings. They, they literally had nothing. They were, they were women, so in their day, they were, they were considered to be property. Um, when they looked in the mirror, they didn't see greatness. They saw what everybody else saw. They saw peons, nobodies. They saw um, orphan girls. They saw, um, they saw rags. And so they were called to a great thing. The common denominator in both of their stories um, is something that I saw years ago and, and something that I want to bring out to you because there's, there's something that both of them had to do in order to get to their destiny and there was something that both of them had to do in order to be prepared to get close to their God. So if you've come through to this fast and maybe you haven't felt close, to the one that you've been trying to get close to th th through the fast. If, you've, if this whole thing has been you trying to get closer to God and you haven't felt him, if you've been trying to, to draw closer to your beloved and, and you've not um, heard from God the way that you want to, um, we're going to give you some, some keys and some clues on how to draw closer to him because both of them had to do it. Um, and there were some key elements that they had to do in order to be prepared for their destiny, to draw closer to their beloved. And um, they did it, and there are some key steps that you and I have to do in order to do that. Right. So during this last week, um, let's follow their steps and see if it gets us closer through this last week That's ourselves. Right. That's right. Um, both Ruth and um, Esther as well, by the way, as David and Aaron and multiple others throughout the word of God did, as they did this. Let's put um, Ruth 3 and 3 up if you don't mind. Um, this is what Ruth had to do. This is actually the, uh, the words that Naomi gave to Ruth um, when she had to go before her kinsman redeemer. This is what um, Naomi told Ruth. She said, Listen, I, I, we've got we to figure out a plan to get you in front of Boaz. And we're going to we're gonna get you in front of Boaz. And there's your kinsman redeemer. We've got to get you in front of him because he's the one that can redeem you. He's the one that can marry you. If, if, um, I can almost figure that this is... Um, I, I can almost... I almost want to start singing the lyrics to, um, to, to Fancy from Reba McIntyre. Um, she's creating a plan. Right. She's creating a plan to get Ruth married off. Yeah. And so if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. But she's creating a plan to get Ruth married off. And this is what she says. Listen, Ruth, there's this very eligible bachelor, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to get you washed up, girl, and we're going to get you anointed, and we're going to put on some, some of your best clothes. I've only got one dress for you, but it's right. a pretty dress, and we're right. going to get you all dolled up, and we're going to put you in the place where when he wakes up, you're going to go down to the threshing floor, and when he wakes up, you're going to be at his feet, and you're going to gain favor in his eyes, and then, fancy don't let me down. Right. Got right. me? And so she creates this plan, and, and this is it. Go wash yourself, go anoint yourself, go put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. Now, see, that's the, that's the plan, and that's the process. But the strange thing is, is you also find those same words in the, in the uh, story of Esther. You see, Esther 
was this little orphan girl. And when she was taken off the street and brought um, into the palace, again, she was an orphan girl. She was a Jewish girl. And you find the exact same thing there. She was taken off the street. She was brought into the palace. And according to the word of God, you see that... Um, in Esther 2, you see that she had to literally be prepared. Before she was brought in before the king, she wasn't just brought off the street and brought before this beauty contest. She had to be prepared. Her preparation process was six months um, being washed and then soaked in oil of myrrh and prepared um, for beautifying uh, treatments, but six months and then another six months. So a year's worth of process. In other words, the girl had a lot of stank on her. You, you, you got me? Are you with me? Yeah. Um, why? Because no one goes before the king smelling like the street. Come on. That's good. And she had to have her best garments put on her and then brought before the king. Ironically, and we're not going to go into David's story, and we're not going to go into Aaron's story, but I want you to know um, that upon writing my book 10, 10 years ago, God brought me to, to understand that these words, um, to go wash yourself, anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, kept repeating itself over and over and over again in the lives of these people. And I started to understand that in order to get to, to, to where you are, to the place of your destiny, that there is this common denominator to go wash yourself, to go anoint yourself, and to go put on your best clothes. And I didn't understand why until I began to do research it. And so I'm not going to take you through all of that journey, but I will say this, as far as Esther is concerned and as far as Ruth is concerned, you have to understand that there's a reason. So if we're called to a great destiny, here's the gist of it, that we've got to wash our faces. We've got to wash ourselves of yesterday if we're going to get anywhere. Come on, come on. So this last week of our, of our journey through our fast, you have to understand that you can't go into your purpose or your destiny or the plan that God has for you. You can't go in to, um, you can't go before the king. You can't get in front of, of God with the same sin and the same junk that you've got all over you from yesterday. You see, maybe the reason why you haven't received a breakthrough yet is that you still got the same sin and the same junk and the same funk sitting on you and you're expecting God to hear you. And so I got to show you a couple of things because I desperately as your pastor want you to get a breakthrough. And it's not fair for us to talk about breakthrough if we're not helping you to understand that there may be some things that are holding you back. So let's take a look at what may still be holding you back so that in this last week you might be able to lop off some stuff and see if it might get you to where you've been trying to get to, okay? So let's take a look at some things. Let's take a look at wash because wash is really, really important. And here's, here's um, how these girls got there and here's how we're going to get there too. You see, washing yourself through this fast, it's really symbolic. What we're doing through this fast is this, is we're washing ourselves. Fasting is symbolic of washing the old off of us. We've collected a lot of junk Come on. over oh, this yeah. past year. Uh -huh. We've collected a lot, of, a lot of filth. We've collected a lot of residual. We've collected a lot of stuff. And what we're doing is we're pushing away the old. And we're, we're recognizing that there's some stuff in our lives that have to go. And we're putting more of God in our lives. And we've established that already. But what we're doing is we're also, we're also looking at the fact that, that, you know, if we haven't gotten a breakthrough, that perhaps it's because we've got to wash ourselves. Let's look, look at Isaiah 1, 15 and 16. Let's take a look at that. When you, uh, Anthony, will you read that for me real quick? You know what's awesome, guys? God wants us to be cleansed, not dirty, when we come before him. Yeah. Watch this. Isaiah 1, 15 and 16 says... When you raise your arms to me in prayer, I will refuse to look at you. Even if you say many prayers, I will not listen to you. Because your hands are full of blood. Watch this. Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Then he said, stop doing the evil things I see you do. Stop doing wrong if you want your prayers answered. 
Come on, guys. Mm. Then he went on, Isaiah went on to say, go now, leave your bonds and slavery. In other words, the addictions and the things that's holding you back. Put your old life far behind you. It is unclean to you. You are the holy people of the Lord. Watch this. Purify or wash yourselves. Huh. I love what the psalmist David said in Psalm 119, verses 9, verse 11. David said, how can a person stay pure? Great question, right? right? Here's what he said. In response, he said, by reading and obeying the word. Come on, guys. Yeah. David went on to say, I have hidden your word where? In my heart, so I will not sin against you. Mm -hmm. So when you look at Esther and, and Ruth, um, we don't necessarily know that there's glaring sin in their life that they have to wash away. So let's apply it just to our lives. If we're not getting a breakthrough, we just want to examine ourselves. Lord, through this fast, I'm not seeing the breakthrough that I want to break that I want to see. So let's just examine our hearts. Is there something in our lives that we're going to the Lord about and we're not laying it down? There's still some areas of our lives that we haven't broken through, that we haven't laid down, that we're still playing with, that we've still got our pet sins, or maybe we've got some things that we're still struggling with, and we want to use this fast to first say, God, I'm going to deal with this before I ask for that. You know, I went into this fast saying, I'm going to make it about this, but you know, maybe I really may need to make it about that. And so we, we need to um, establish that we need to wash ourselves and come to you, Lord, with a pure heart and not a double mind yeah. and clean hands. And so that's what the David part would be about. Now, when we look at Aaron or, or, or Ruth and Esther, the washing part, what is so powerful to me is this. See, wash also means this. Let's take a look at that, that next um, slide that we have. The washing part also means this. We wash our faces after we do what? After we mourn, after we grieve, after we express sorrow. Right. You see, when Ruth came, she came back with um, Naomi, and she had just lost her husband. She lost her husband. She lost her father-in-law. She was a foreigner. She was in a, a, a foreign place. She had absolutely nothing. Life had dealt her a raw hand. She was in a terrible place. She was there in this place, and she had nothing. She still had her mourning clothes on, and I don't mean her jammies. She had her mourning clothes on, and she's literally walking around in rags with her mourning clothes on. When she looked at her life, she saw nothing good. There was nothing, and you've seen this, this funky thing before. When she looked at her life, there was nothing going for her. She had every right to look in the mirror and go, life bites right now. There is nothing going my way. There is no reason for me to get out of bed. Draw the shades. Leave me alone. There's nothing going for me right now. Everywhere I turn, there's death. She lost her own husband, but she also lost, literally, every man in her life dropped dead. Do you recognize that? Sounds like our family, Mom. Mom. Literally, for, for literally, we, we buried like six men in our, in our lives in two years. Starting with my ninth grade year of school. We women are strong. Men, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> when he found that out, he said, you women are tough on men. 
I mean, literally, when she looked in the mirror, nothing going for her. And she had every reason to mourn. And I just want you to understand that she, when she looked in the mirror, she was mourning. She was weeping. Everything in her life was going wrong. But, but, she had to wash her face. And she had to recognize that Ecclesiastes 3 and 4 says this, there is a time to weep, but there's also a time to laugh. There is a time to mourn, but there's also a time to dance. And let me have you understand something. Do not try to dance before you mourn, otherwise you're just faking it. And there will come a time where you will be flat on your face realizing, what is wrong with me? I was fine. No, you weren't. You didn't take time to mourn. You were trying to dance, and it just hit you. I love the story of these two women because they understand that, that, that they looked in the mirror and they realized that there is a time to mourn, but there's also a time to get up from your mourning and move on. Come on. That we don't camp out in our mourning. That God gives us an opportunity to sit in sackcloth and ashes and mourn. But then he comes by and he says, listen, it's time to move on now. When the Israelites lost their leader, he said, listen, I'm giving you 30 days to sit in sackcloth and ashes and mourn this sucker out, and I will be back, and we are moving on. You see, if you've ever met somebody that stayed too long in their mourning, they're still walking around moping and grieving and, and hurting over that thing, and they've never moved forward. These two women understood something, that they've got people waiting on them. That God has called them to go do something for him and they can't afford to stay there too long or they'll never accomplish anything for him. That God understands what grief is and what pain is and what hurt is and what sorrow is and he will meet you right there in that place. But there is a time that you've got to get up from that place and you've got to move forward to wash your face and then to move forward. These women understood that, that there's somebody waiting on them and that you can't stay too long in it. That it's time to forgive yourself and to forgive others right. and to move forward. That's right. Guys, step number two, number one, we wash ourselves. Number two, watch this, we anoint ourselves. The word anoint, according to the Hebrew word, is the word suk. And it means to anoint with lotions and oils to make yourself smell better. Anointing yourself, watch this, anointing yourself is essentially making yourself feel better, being more pleasant to be around, and basically it's about giving you a brand new attitude. Mm -hmm. Come on, guys. Do you realize we're supposed to anoint ourselves with a new attitude just like Ruth did? Think about this. When Naomi asked her to help her find a new home, Ruth did not respond with a bad attitude. She didn't pitch a fit because things didn't go her way. Come on, she didn't wallow in self-pity. She didn't moan or groan, but she got on board, and God blessed her because of her attitude of gratitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come on, think about this. Ruth said, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Amen. Guys, often we want to wait for our circumstances to change before we get a, a, a good attitude. Mm. But that's not what happened. The situation didn't change. She was still a childless widow. She was still a foreigner. She could have walked around complaining about her life and all of its unfairness, but she chose instead to wa wash off the filth of the field. She chose instead to wash off the pain of the, and the grief of her loss of her husband. She couldn't bring him back. She recognized that. She chose to go forward and embrace God's plan for her life. All right, and here's what's cool. I wanted to say this, and I didn't want to get ahead of myself. Watch, it's because of Ruth's awesome and amazing attitude, Boaz noticed her. And the Bible says he married her. When she was in the field, she found favor in his eyes, and he fell head over heels for her. Can you say amen? Now, here's the cool part. Do you realize that Boaz had a special place in his heart for nobodies from nowhere? He had a special place in his heart for people that were down and out who were broke, busted, and disgusted. Can I get a witness, somebody? Why? Because he looked at her and he found value in her while most people would look and turn the other way when they saw a foreigner that was from a pagan country. You know why he had a special place in his heart? If you do some research and you find out in Matthew, uh, we find that the Boaz's mother was a very familiar person we read about in the Bible. Her name was Rahab. Think about this. 
Rahab the harlot was the mother of Boaz, who became a very wealthy landowner. Come on, the best-looking bachelor in all of Bethlehem. Come on, guys. So he had a special place in his heart. Why? Because his mom was a nobody from nowhere that God had favor on. Can you say amen? Now, here's the cool part. She went from rejected to accepted, from rags to riches, from lack, come on, to luxury, from not enough to more than enough. Why? Because God gave her favor in his eyes. Can you say amen? Yeah. Now, here's a cool part of the story. Watch this. The Bible says that, that uh, Boaz married Ruth and began to have a family. They had a son by the name of Obed. Mm -hmm. Obed had a son named Jesse. Jesse had a son named David. We call him King David. Can you say amen? Yeah. Think about this. You have a harlot and, or a prostitute, and then you have a foreigner from a pagan land, both used in the very lineage because David was the lineage that Jesus Christ came from. Don't ever count anybody down and out. Amen. Because God can count them up and in. Can you say amen? Amen. Show me this real quick. We're running out of time. Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. Amen. Life is 10% what happens to you, 90% how you react to it. Hmm. Number three, guys, is this. We said that you need to wash yourself. You need to anoint yourself. Don't wait for your circumstance to change. Choose to wash yourself to anoint yourself. Sometimes you have to stand in the mirror and you have to tell yourself who you are in Christ. You have to anoint yourself with the words that God says about you and you have to put on your best clothes. Right. Those words put on were used more than 50 times in the word of God. Come on, think about it. More than 50 times in the word of God. And here's what they mean. It means literally to put on, to become one with. Um, do you remember... And this is the best way that, that I, that when I was writing the book, that God um, showed me how it was. Do you, do you remember um, being a little kid and, um, and your mama taking a beach towel and putting it around your neck with a safety pin and it becoming a cape? Did anybody ever do that? Come on, don't be ashamed. Can I see your hand if that beach towel ever became a cape? And you just instantly became Superman or Superwoman. Or how about if you ever went to Kmart or wherever, and you got some new shoes, and man, did they make you fast! Super fast. I mean, you got new shoes, and somehow, some way, you became one with those shoes. And you were so unbelievably fast that, like, the minute they got on your feet, you ran through the store, and you were so unbelievably fast, right? Watch out for the <laughs> and you became one with them, right? You put on that beach towel, and you became one with it, and you just ran around, and you jumped off of high things, and that was your cape, and you became one with it. You put it on, you became one with it, it's the same way an actor puts on a costume and becomes one with it and becomes, like Jim Carrey said, becomes the Grinch. It's the way, unfortunately, Heath Ledger became the Joker to the point where he couldn't take it off to his demise. You see, according to the word of God, when we put something on, we become one with it. And it's what we're supposed to do with Christ. The Bible says that we're supposed to put on Christ. It means that we come to him in our filthy rags as we are. And this is who we are when we come to him. But we're supposed to do this. Let me see the verses. That we're supposed to put on our new self, mm -hmm. created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness according to the truth. You see, according to the truth, that's not who we are. Mm -hmm. It's what we did. It's how we walked. It's, 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 what we, it's what we used to participate in, but it's not who we are. 
You see, when Ruth looked in the mirror, I'm sure that she saw all the old rags. But when she put on her new self, she, she had to take off if you back up. Because you see, you can't put on something new until you take off the old. So back up real quick. Take, give me the next scripture. If you don't mind, you got to back up. Instead of going to 24, you got to go to 22 and you got to say this. You were taught regarding your old former way of life to put off your old self. That means I can't put on my new self until I take off my old self. So you got to take off the old self and you got to recognize that this isn't who I am because now I understand whose I am. So I have to take off my old self because all the old self is my old corrupted, deceitful desires. That's not who I am. It's just how I walked, right? Right, right? So we have to take that off, and then we have to change and get a new attitude. Remember, because your attitude is really just the, the, the way that you thought, and we'll get to that in just a second. And then we have to put on our new self. We have to put on righteousness. Literally, the Bible says to put on righteousness. Not what we do, right, but what Christ did right for us. So then we put on our new self, created to be like God, true righteousness, holiness, according to the truth. You say, according to the truth, this is who I am. Not because of me, but because of what Christ did in me and for me. So every day when I wake up in the morning, if I'm going to be pleasing to God in the way that I need to go to God in this last week of my fast is not, oh, a piece of garbage. If it wasn't 50 degrees outside, I wouldn't have these stupid boots on, and I would have my poop shoes on instead, my poop emoji boots. Because some of you walk around, even though you're a Christian, you walk around like you've stepped in crap every day. You're a Christian, but every day it's like, my life sucks. Yeah, yeah, I'm down and I'm out. What's wrong with your life? Nothing really. Nothing really. There's nothing wrong, really. But there's no victory in your life. There's no joy in your life. Even though Jesus Christ has given you joy and he's given you victory and he's given you everything that you need, we literally walk through our lives with this still on as though it's who we are. Why? Because you, because you had bad thoughts today. That's the enemy's job. Cast them down. Put on a new mind. We're going to get to that in a second. Let's keep looking at it. What else are we supposed to put on? See, according to the word of God, we're supposed to put on the new self. We're supposed to put on the new self. See, you've seen me do this before. See, some of you don't really understand the analogy of, of the whole, like, you know, those things. So I'll give you the one that you've seen before because some of you understand this a little bit better. Because you've seen this one before. And you'll remember this one a lot better. Forget about the new self. You remember the new man. You remember the old man, right? The old man has anger and idolatry and negativity and immorality and greed and strife and lust and pride and fear and, and attitude and self-sabotage and doubt and lies and self-justification, excuses and sin. You see, this says to put on the new man. That means I have to take the old man and I need to nail him to the cross. And see, see, see sometimes my, new, my old man just comes on and he just hangs all over me. And he weighs me down. And I can't stand him. And he tells me that I'm no good. And he just weighs me down. And it's all the old thoughts. And it's all the old everything. And it's all the old desires. And it's all the old drawing me back. And I literally have to wrestle him to the ground. And then he resurrects the next day. And there he is again. And he just keeps on strangling me sometimes. And every single day. And some days, some days he doesn't even show up. But other days, he's there again. And I literally have to take him and wrestle him to the ground. And some days, every day, I have to nail him to the freaking cross and keep him there so that I can go on about my day and put on my new man. Do you understand that analogy? Because the new man is who I am in Christ, and that old man belongs on the cross, and that's where he stays. That's where he stays. That is not who I am. Who I am is in Christ. Who I am is in Christ. I am the righteousness of Christ Jesus. I am his. All my old thoughts, they come back because the enemy offers them to me. 
but I don't have to take them. I don't have to run with them. I don't have to think on them. I don't have to obey them. I don't have to go with them. I don't have to. That's right. I don't have to. He offers them to me, but I don't have to. And that brings us to the next thought. Yes, the Bible says in Philippians 4, 8, let's, let's go to the next screen. Philippians 4, 8, it talks about putting on the right, right thought. thoughts. How many know that right thoughts produce right things? Come yeah. Come on. Can, can I get a better amen than that? Right yeah. thoughts produce right things. Watch this. The Bible says fix your thoughts on what is true, good, right, pure, holy, friendly, and proper. Don't ever stop thinking about what is truly worthwhile and worthy of praise. Now, here's the thing, guys. I want to just point this out to you. Don't bother praying that God will help you to feel something different. Because God doesn't deal in the currency of feelings. God doesn't help you feel anything. Feelings are fickle. They change all the time. He doesn't help you feel things. God does not help us to feel anything. Feelings are human. So don't go before God and say, God, please help me feel something for my husband or my wife. Please help me feel differently about that friend that I cannot stand. Please help me feel differently about that. Please help me feel differently about my math class. No. God doesn't help us feel anything. Our feelings come from our thoughts, whether we like it or not. We feel what we feel. Put that next thing up, please. I feel the way I feel because I think the way I think. Right. Our feelings come from our thoughts. Yeah. So the only way to change our feeling is to change our thoughts. Yeah. So God doesn't even control our thoughts either. But he does tell us how to think. Yeah. And that's the verse that Pastor just read from Philippians 4 and 8. This is how God helps us. He says, I'm not going to change the way you feel. And I'm not actually going to change the way you think. But I did tell you how to think, and it's up to you to obey that, to control your thought life. Think about what you're thinking about. Control your thought life. I told you how. It's up to you. I'm not going to come down and take your hand and tell you how to eat, but I did tell you in my word how to eat to be healthy. You see, God gave us our Bibles as a manual, and if we don't obey it, then we're on our own. Because he's given us how to do. We feel the way we feel because we think the way we think. So how do we, how are we more pleasing to God? How are we more desirable to God? Put on right thoughts. Through this fast, when you're going before God, don't go to God asking him to help you to feel something. If you've already done that, that's why you're not getting an answer. Because he's not going to help you to feel differently about anything. He's waiting on you to change your thoughts, Come on. That's and that's going to help you that's good. the rest of this week. Amen. Amen. Lastly, let's get this done. Guys, the Bible says put on love. Think about that. Put on love. The Bible says in Colossians 3, 12 through 15, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, Forgive as the Lord has forgave you. And mm. over all these virtues, put on love. Hmm. So in this last fast, if you're going before the Lord and you're not getting an answer, check your heart. Mm -hmm. Because if there's something between you and somebody else, that might be blocking your answers. That's right. Put on thankfulness and gratitude. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 no matter what happens and in all circumstances, and that's what I love about Ruth and Esther, in all circumstances, no matter what, they were always thankful. Wow. This is God's will for you who belong to Jesus Christ. Guys, sometimes it's a matter of not looking at the bad mm -hmm. and turning and choosing to look at what's right, that's right. choosing to look at what's good. That's right. Sometimes that relationship you're fasting about, it's just a matter of looking at what's right with that person Come instead on. of always what's wrong with Come that on. person. That's good. That's good. Sometimes your breakthrough is literally in your perspective. Yeah. Yeah. That breakthrough is literally on the other side of you changing your perspective. That's right. Amen. Oh, my. That's good. 
And then put on a garment of praise, Isaiah 61 and 3. Bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair or heaviness. Yeah. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Guys, when you go before the Lord, please remember something. God does not inhabit the pain of his people. He does not inhabit the pain of his people. So when we go before the Lord this last week, do not go and give God a pity party. Are you telling me God doesn't care? No, no. I'm telling you God cares. But start with praise. God inhabits the praises of his people. And when we go to the Lord with praise, God inhabits that praise. God shows up. You see, sometimes we spend so much time complaining and whining and oh, woe is me -ing. We spend so much time looking at ourselves and our issues and our problems and our junk that we have not bothered to look at the greatness and the goodness and the fullness and the glory of our God. We have not taken any time to study out who God is and how God is and what God's done. We have not taken any time to praise God and love God and worship God and thank God for what he's already done and who God already is. And maybe, just maybe, if we would turn from the me, 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 and the I, 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 and we would begin to look at him, 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 what would we find? God does not inhabit the pain of his people. He inhabits the praise of his people. He desires to shine through us and to show through us as oaks, mighty oaks for his splendor. What does that mean? It means that he called us to be mighty oaks. It means that he made us to be strong and steady and showing his glory. Not walking around moping with no joy, no victory, but to stand firm. You know what I love about Esther and, and, um, and Ruth? They had every opportunity to be moping around, no victory, no joy, no purpose. They were hurting. They had every right to say, I don't want to. I, 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 I can't do it. I'm just me. Do you know what I've been through? But they washed their face. They anointed themselves. They reminded themselves of who they were in God. They got a new attitude. And they put on their purpose and they moved forward. Are you here today? And you've said beyond a shadow of a doubt, when I walk in to the presence of God, I want to be prepared. I want to go before God and I want to know who I am in Him. I want to go into this week, into this last fasting week, and I want to be sure. I want to go before God. I want to go with a pure heart with clean hands, with a single mind, and I want to say, God, I'm here. I want to be used by you. I want to go before God, and I want to say, God, help me to change my attitude. Help me, God, to put on love. Help me, God, to put on forgiveness. Help me, God, to not be double-minded. Help me to change my attitude. Help me to change how I'm looking at people. Help me to... Help me to change my perspective with those people in my life that I'm really wanting you to do it. But I know that it's on, my, it's on me. It's on me to do it, Lord. Help me, Lord. Are you here today and you say, I get it. I get it, Lord. I know how to go into this last week with boldness, with strength, with confidence, knowing who you made me to be. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. God has called us to this fast, and he wants to give us those answers. If there's anything standing in your way, I pray that you would let it 
let it die right here. Lay it down before the Lord and move forward. God's going to give you the victory that you're looking for. The breakthrough is right on the other side. God's called you to great things. He's going to use you mightily. There's nothing standing in your way. There's nothing standing in your way. Father, I thank you today that we're going to wash ourselves. That we're going to renew our mind and we're going to take off our old selves and we are going to come to you boldly before your throne knowing that you hear us. We know who we are in you. And you have called us to do great things. We're looking for our breakthrough. It's coming. It's coming. Father, we thank you.